All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex. I think a lot of you are repeats, so thanks for coming. And I'm one of the Adobe support specialists at the University of Arizona. Uh, Brian Puentes here. He's our lead Adobe specialist. He'll be manning the chat, um, answering questions or interrupting to read questions, which we highly encourage. It's interrupting is not a negative term in this case. Um, so please ask away if, if something isn't working for you, we want it to work. If I did something too fast or the computer lagged and you missed it, I'll do it again. I'm absolutely happy to. So this workshop is an advanced editing workshop, and it's more of a just a deeper dive to get you more advanced. I don't think we're going to do anything too, um, too taxing, but it is a lot of ideas and, and combining a lot of things. So that's why we call it a more advanced process. Um, so let's look at our, uh, I don't think we need, I'm not gonna keep this page open, but just so you know, this page is where the recording will live if you'd like to access it. Um, I'd also invite you to visit our next wave of workshops. Probably all of you have seen them already, but I'm gonna put it in the chat anyway. Um, this is our final workshop of the first wave, and the theme was video and photo. Um, next week, well, next week there's no wave, no, there's no workshops, but the week after, we will be focusing on graphic design and user experience and interface design, which, which will be pretty fun. Um, UX, UI is an especially contemporary concept, so if, if you're not sure what it is, check it out, because XD is a really... Um, a really fun to use tool, uh, which sometimes a lot of those tools can't aren't quite so fun. Okay, enough about that. So let's look at what we're doing today. I'm going to open up Lightroom here. We're going to take this raw file that I shot in Portland a few years ago. And in Lightroom, we're going to edit it like this. We're going to adjust it. We're going to use our, the available tools to you know, make our sky more dramatic, bring out detail in the shadows, correct a little distortion and clean up some parts. Um, and then we're gonna see why we still need Photoshop. And we're going to go ahead and take it further, remove unwanted parts of the images, close a window for privacy, make the sky more dramatic, uh, fill in the empty part of the clouds, and then just for fun, we'll also talk about changing the sky up. Sound good? Should be pretty fun. And I, I made us a little, little checklist so that uh, I do a good job. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you've got your files. What I would like you to start by doing, see some thumbs up, is opening Lightroom and going to the import dialog, which is in the lower left, it says import. And you can find your files through the left-hand navigation. You can select the source here and just do other. Or if you're like me, you can open up an Explorer or Finder window. The only image we're gonna use in Lightroom today, which is kind of funny because Lightroom's biggest power is batch editing, but that's okay. Um, we're just gonna drop pdx.dng in here. And you'll see it'll pull the whole folder in there, only check pdx.png for us. And I've already got it on my computer somewhere that I want it to live. So I'll just click the add button and then import. Um, before we get started on any editing, I hope you guys noticed that this ends in .dng. Does anybody know what .dng is a acronym for? That's okay, I'm here to tell you. It stands for digital negative. Digital, got the D. Um, and I always forget that I, I, don't, uh, I think acronyms are ones that aren't an exact shortening and abbreviations are actual letters, but I don't know. I'm just a photo dude. Um, so DNG is a raw, file format. Uh, this is Adobe's raw file format. And I really like DNG 
because it's the least likely to disappear of raw file formats. For example, if you own Olympus cameras, I believe they are not making Olympus cameras anymore. So their raw format will become obsolete and potentially no longer supported. Um, so Adobe makes it really easy to convert to DNG when you import. If anybody wants to see that at the end, uh, I'm happy to demonstrate. I just got a little aside there. Okay, so here we are in the library mode, which is hopefully familiar because you came to our first Lightroom workshop. Um, and we're just gonna jump into editing this image. And what we're going to do in Lightroom is make a virtual copy. I'm gonna show you a preset that I made, and then we're gonna make all these edits and a mystery one. That's actually just a mistake. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to develop mode. I can press D on the keyboard or click develop. I love keyboard shortcuts, so I will always tell them to you if I know them. All right, and if we look at this image, we can see that I have a classic problem where I had a really cool sky and an interesting foreground, and I only took one picture. And my exposure, the amount of light I let in was for the sky. And that gave me a dark foreground. Um, ideally with digital photography, you want to expose for the highlights. You cannot recover detail from something that has been completely overexposed, like here in the sky, we can recover a little, but uh, not like we might. Um, it's a lot easier to recover shadow detail, which you will see. So when in doubt, underexpose a little bit. And what I wanna show you is something really cool in Lightroom called virtual copies. And to make a virtual copy, you right click and you go down and you choose create virtual copy. And you can make as many virtual copies as you like. And if I go look in my finder, show in finder, you will see that there's still only one copy of this image. So I can create multiple versions of the same file without taking up any more space, or maybe like a tiny bit of space. Um, so I could make this one black and white, I can make this one uh, cropped to a square. And I could make this one the one we're working on. Um, so this is a really clever way to try different things with your photographs. So if you make one edit and you don't want to undo everything you did, make a virtual copy and then try the other stuff. Um, OK, so let's and you just hit delete on the keyboard to remove a virtual copy if you don't want it. You can also stack them, but okay. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of the tools, not all of them, and a lot of them will do similar things. So it's always going to be a functional choice and a stylistic choice. You can get to the same destination doing a combination of different things. Um, I made a preset of what I did. So if I were to just click on this user preset, it will immediately apply all of the adjustments I did with one click of a button. So we're gonna do them all again and turn it into a preset, but I just want you to see how cool presets are um, and that you see it, it was all 100% Lightroom editing. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is crop this image a little straighter, just to be sure. So I'm gonna grab the crop tool and in this case, I want this corner of the building to be my straight line. This, this, this has a little bit of that perspective to it. Um, it was a wide angle lens, so there's some distortion. So we have to accept that there will be lines that are not straight. We're taking the three-dimensional world and smushing it into 2D. So I'm gonna grab this level tool and I'm gonna draw a line that follows the corner of the building about like that. Pretty good. Um, I think, I think I'm happy with that. So I'm gonna click done or hit enter. It looks a little crooked actually. I don't know about you guys. So I'm gonna press command Z a couple times. And I think I'm just gonna leave it. I think that's kind of the angles working for me already, but I always check. All right, the next thing I wanna do 
is actually toward the bottom. Um, if you're using a, a more established camera, like a Canon, a Nikon, a Sony, um, Panasonic, not all Panasonic lenses have them, but um, these lenses have profiles built into Lightroom and just camera raw in general, where they will know common issues with the color, um, the vignetting of the corners, distortion, and something called chromatic aberration, and all this, these little things that you can click and correct with one click. So I'm going to go down all the way down to this lens corrections tab. And all I'm going to do is enable profile corrections. And what I, what I want you to notice is I'm going to lose a little bit of barrel distortion. The corners are going to get um, brighter. You can see some vignetting here. Um, some people do that stylistically, but you want to start from a, a clean image, in my opinion. So enable profile corrections. OK, so there's after. Um, to see before and after in Lightroom, it is backslash below your delete key, above your entry key. So before, after. So just a little, it's, it's subtle, but it makes a big difference on a finished image. All right, any questions so far? I've already done a few adjustments. I think, I think we're doing good. All right, so let's go back to the top. And what I'm gonna do to this image is I'm gonna lose some detail when I first start, and then I'm gonna bring it back as I work through my other adjustments. So don't get scared because Lightroom is non-destructive and if we lose detail for a little bit, it's temporary. So the first thing I wanna do is pull the exposure up just a little bit to see a little more detail. I'm just gonna bring it up 0.6. You can grab the slider if you're more precise, you can click in there and enter a number. Um, you can even use the up arrows and down arrows. Just make sure you hit enter when you're done. Okay, that's exposure. Exposure adjusts the overall brightness of the image, the details and all of that. And I said, give me a little more detail. You might've noticed that I'm already losing the sky. My sky is not as impressive, but let's keep going. I'm only worried about the foreground right now. We'll bring the sky back later. Um, next, I'm actually gonna go down to my tone curve which you might need to open up. And the first thing I'd like you to do is switch it from this kind of S shape and click the first circle, that kind of light gray circle. That's going to switch our S curve from a slider tool to an actual curve, a point curve tool. So if I'm on slider, um, it's, it's kind of constrained to how you can move the points. If I'm on point curve or custom mode, um, I can just drag my curve however I want, which is what we want. We want control. Okay, Command Z, that's too much. So the tone curve is my absolute favorite uh, image adjusting tool um, because it can do a lot in, in just a few clicks. And my general routine is eh, move the exposure a little bit, but then go to the tone curve and then go back up and clean things up that I might have lost or overdone. So if we look at the tone curve, we can see a single line going from bottom left to top right. That's, that's our exposure and contrast, how much, um, how bright or dark that part of the image is. So if you look behind it, it's overlaid on top of this, sorry, on top of this um, mountain range, which is what we call a histogram. And this histogram describes our image from darkest to brightest. Um, and the points represent how much of our image is that darkness or brightness. Okay, phone on moon mode. There we go. Okay. So as you see, my image actually has a huge peak of bright area. That would be the sky. And then it has this other pretty good chunk of dark area, which is my foreground. If I move the exposure up, you'll see my histogram change shape. But let's not do that. Command Z. 
So the classic thing to do with the tone curve is to drop a point toward the bottom and drop a point toward the top. And all I'm doing is clicking on the line. And then you give it an S shape, kind of like the original mode it was on. And that's how you increase your contrast. The dark parts got a little darker. The bright parts got a little brighter. This is a really um, surefire way to, to give an image a little more punch, a little more presence. But I, what I've done is taken an image with a bad exposure and given it more contrast. So we're actually going to get a little crazier. We're going to drop a point above the bottom one and pull it up. And we're going to move this point, this very top point, down a little bit. Um, and you can see we move these around to bring our foreground to a brighter exposure. So take a moment to look at my curve because I, I apparently can't use the curve and talk at the same time. I, I put three points in here, one at the top, two toward the bottom. I took the head, I call this thing a snake or a noodle, whatever you want to call it. So it has a head. Um, I pulled the head down a little bit. Um, that's just kind of a, a trendy habit where you, you take your white points and make them a little um, subdued. And I moved this down as well because you can see that this part targets the sky. Um, I don't need to do something like this to get the sky back. We're going to do it a different way um, because you can see some other parts of the image got really um, bland. So we're going to leave our sky overexposed. We did a tone curve just for the foreground. I'll give you a moment to do something similar. Um, do it to your taste. You don't need to match what I did. And any any um, questions? I think the tone curve is intimidating, but it really is. Just click and see, um, undo if something weird happened, and it's a fun tool. It's my favorite. All right, let's see some thumbs up if we're okay. If we got where we would like to be, at least a little bit happy. Beautiful. Um, as a little side note, you might notice. I love the party hats. Is that a party hat? Um, you've got red, green, and blue. Those are our channels, our color channels. All light we perceive is a combination of red, green, and blue. It's the additive uh, color spectrum, if you will. Um, if you were like me when you were little and you like to smush your face up against an old CRT TV, you could see the three bars, red, green, and blue, that made up each, each uh pixel of the screen and as you went back they became an actual image um, so you can actually target specific channels so if you see red the opposite of red is cyan and if i want to use this to color correct to stylize to tone specific parts i can do that just just for fun i'll show you if i pull the middle down my image becomes more cyan if i pull the middle up my image becomes more red um, something that you can take further if you like all right, so now let's see if we can get some of our sky back just with the sliders. Um, and then we will try a couple other things. If you like, you can close your tone curve panel. And also, do you see this little tiny switch next to the name? Um, that's a quick way to see what your adjustment is or isn't doing. So you can toggle it on and off if you want to see just what that section did. Of course, backslash shows you every change you've made. All right. So what I'm going to do is just pull the highlights down. And that brought, that brought back a little bit. So again, highlights are right here. Um, and that's just because I would like some of that detail back. And I can pull the shadows up if I want more detail in the front. And I think I do. So. I'm going to take the, the highlights down all the way to, to 90, and I'm going to take the shadows up about 12. So the only one you can't turn off and on is your basic adjustments. So um, I didn't realize that. Um, 
whites and blacks, we didn't go into them too hard last time, but highlights are the details of the brightest parts of your image. If you pull the highlights down, you're bringing details back. If you pull the highlights up, you're bringing, you're blowing details out. And you can see that very clearly if you look in the deer, I pulled it up, it's almost gone. I pulled it down, I can see it's blue again. Oh, this is a great question, Zachary, and maybe I already answered it, but there aren't any highlights in the foreground, are there? It was all shadow. So the foreground, we target with the shadows adjustment. Really good question. So the, his question was, why doesn't highlights impact the foreground? Um, and then whites and blacks actually affects how bright that part of your image is, how bright the brightest parts are. It doesn't actually affect the detail. It just affects, well, it can blow the detail out. That's not true, but um, it can't bring detail back. It just makes the white a little less white, a little grayer and so on. And same thing for blacks. Um, pulling blacks down is a really great way to um, add contrast to an image as well. If you didn't quite get there with, kind of with uh, curves. All right, okay, so we, we pulled back a little bit of detail using the highlights. Um, I don't think the sky looks as cool as it did originally, right? We still lost that, that wow. Um, so let's go ahead and use our selective adjustment tools, which is something we've not talked about. And what we're going to do Let's look at this. Okay, cool. I'm gonna start by a little cleanup and then we'll go and fix the sky. Um, if you've ever seen these little boogers on your images, um, they're really hard to escape because, and let's see, there we go. Um, we get dust on our camera sensors. We get some schmutz and surprisingly, I thought there were a lot more, but I'm only seeing the one obvious one. The other ones might show up um, as we make an adjustment. But this little speck is, is a speck of dust on my sensor. And when you take pictures outside, you have to use a smaller aperture. Smaller apertures make these boogers show up more. They're really easy to fix. So um, if I press Q on the keyboard or I click on the circle with an arrow, I can activate spot removal. And what this tool does, here, let's, let's see a more obvious thing. Um, when I'm in this tool, I zoom in by pressing Z on the keyboard. I zoom out by pressing Z again. And I hit space bar to switch to this hand tool that lets me move my picture around. Um, some of you might be inclined to use your mouse wheel or your trackpad, but that changes the size of your tool. So what this does is you select what you want to remove by painting over it, and it throws out a second circle in the same shape. That second circle is what Lightroom is sampling and blending to remove the part you clicked on. So if I let go of this, we're gonna watch it blend. So we see the sample, it's copying the pixels from this circle over to my original circle. And it blended it in a little bit, but not really. If I go to clone, it'll just put it right on top. But um, that's what it does. You can put as many dots down as you like. They will each have their own sample. Um, but let's click on these dots and remove them. Let's hold space bar and find that one little booger. There it is. I'm gonna make my brush just a little bigger, give it a click and remove it. Um, and this is a tool that you can use on, you know, <laughs> pimples, unwanted small things in your images. I could take the trees out using this way. Um, I find it a little uh, unsatisfying with the results aren't quite what I would like, but you can use it, but it, you get this weird, if you do something on the edge, it tends to get a little lost in the blend. So you might have to use clone instead. Um, those are the two modes that it has. Clone just puts pixels on top. Heal will try and blend them, turn it into this like combination of the source and destination. Any questions about the Quick Heal tool? It's, use it quickly. Um, it's in its name. Don't try and do anything 
crazy with it. That's that's why we have Photoshop. Okay, that's one of our selective editing tools. It's more of a retouching tool. Let's go ahead and go to the graduated filter tool. Um, this is a gradient that applies whatever adjustments you, adjustments you tell you you tell it to. Excuse me, um, in a fading fashion, like a linear gradient, and it will start at 100% and fade to 0%. The length and size of the fade depends on the gradient that you draw. Um, in photography terms, it's called a graduated filter because there used to be filters you would put on the front of your camera. Uh, they used in, in video and all over too, but they would literally have a gradient on them. And that's how you would take exposures at sunset to make the sky and the foreground have a similar exposure. It would darken the sky to your camera. So that's what we'll do. I am on graduated filter. The keyboard shortcut is M. Yeah, of course, all the time in video, Brian. Thank you. Um, so let's just see if I click and drag. The red is what we call our mask. Um, and the mask, in this case, is where the adjustment is taking place. So if I do a very small one, you see it quickly fades. As I drag it out more, and I'm just clicking and holding, it, flay, it fades more progressively, more gradually, if you will. Um, if I don't like where I clicked, I can move it around, or I can click on it and hit delete. You can have as many graduated filters as, on an image as you like. So I could have one going this way that makes the image warm, and I could have one going this way that makes the image cool. And you might see, you might find the mask overlay distracting. You can press O on the keyboard for overlay, or you can click right here where it says show selected mask overlay. And you can see I have this, uh, this looks like a, a Marvel comics um, movie poster where everything's always orange and blue, right? If you ever look at them. Um, but that's not what we're doing here. We're bringing our sky back. So I'm going to click and delete. I'm going to turn my mask back on and I will click and drag and have a graduated filter that is for the sky. Let's go ahead and turn the mask off. Everybody able to draw a graduated filter? I, st I started kind of at the top and ended at the sign. You can adjust it afterwards. That's why I'm not too worried about it. All right, let's just pull the exposure down. And if I was only editing in Lightroom, I might add saturation, I might add clarity or contrast, I might add a little bit of warmth um, or coolness, depending on how I want my sky to look. Maybe a little coolness is kind of fun. But I know that I'm going to use Photoshop to really finish that sky. So I'm really just worried about getting some details in there. What do we think? We okay with our graduated filter? Anybody need help? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and you could have done one in the foreground and brightened that up too, but it would be really easy to see, um, which is why I did this for the sky and actually went in with, with curves and the sliders for the foreground. All right, now let's look at our um, we're going to skip the radial filter, but I'll demonstrate it. The radial filter is the same idea as the graduated filter, except it starts from the center and spills out. Um, and it works two ways. Either it disappears from the center and affects the outside, or it, it affects the center and fades out. Um, so that is one thing that I would like to show you. So right now it's making the outside affected of my circle. So if I pull the saturation down, the outside fades to black and white. If I want the opposite, I click on this invert button. Hopefully you guys can see where my mouse is. And now it starts black and white and fades to color. You'll also see this feather slider that affects that fade, if you will. If I turn it to zero, there's no fade. I just put a circle of adjustment. And um, if I pull it up, then it's really faded. And like I said before, you can have as many 
adjustments as you like. Oops, I turned it off. And they will affect one another. So I added another one with a zero feather that just pulls the exposure down. Um, the sky looks kind of cool like that. But uh, that's the radial filter. Let's click on these dots and delete them. I'm just hitting delete on the keyboard. An important thing to mention, if you click on your graduated filter again, you will see a dot to represent each filter that you've added. If you no longer want it, or if you want to adjust it again, that is how you get back to that. Um, nothing in Lightroom is permanent. You can always take it back or change it. Okay, I'm keeping it though. I'm gonna press K on my keyboard for adjustment brush. Um, I don't know why it's K, <laughs> it just is. If anyone has any ideas on why they chose K, um, it might just be because adjustment J next to K, it might be near M for graduated filter, which also doesn't make sense, but that's okay. We don't have to understand everything to use it. So I'm gonna use this for a very small part of the image. Um, I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna press Z. I'm gonna, I'll oh, see, look, there's another, see that that exposure revealed more dust boogers. So I'm gonna press Q really quick and take some more out. Oh yeah, there's a lot more. Generally in the sky, I don't really pay too much attention to, um, oh yeah, get out of here. My camera's dirty. I don't pay too much attention to where the sample goes um, because it's blending and it's just grabbing other clouds. All right. Sorry for my uh, easily distracted nature. So I pressed key again, back to the adjustment brush. And all I'm gonna do is try and make this, the old town a little less, um, it looks a little blown out. So with my brush, I can use my mouse key, my um, mouse wheel to make this bigger and smaller, or I can use the bracket keys um, like in Photoshop. If you look at my brush, it's got a plus in the middle. That means I'm painting on my mask. It's got an inner circle around it. That's where, that's the size of my brush uh, technically. And then outside of it is the feather. So. If I go over to feather, I can change that outside circle. Size is the overall size, excuse me. Um, and density is kind of like transparency. Um, let's just keep it at 100 for now. If you like keyboard shortcuts, you can hold shift and that will change the size of your feather. All right, so I can make all these adjustments as many times as I like with as many different brushes. But all I'm going to do is click inside old, old Town here. So I'm gonna show selected mask overlay again. And I'm just going to paint on top of this. And I'll also paint over here just for fun. Oh, that's a good time. All right, let's turn my mask overlay off. And again, whatever I slide here will get painted, will get adjusted where I painted. Um, so I can pull the shadows down or up and pull the exposure up. Um, I can change the strength of the colors. I can do a lot of things. Um, we're being realistic here. Generally, you usually just do subtle adjustments like pulling the highlights down or the exposure a little bit, um, or maybe up, whatever you wanna do. Um, and maybe I'm just gonna pull the saturation down because it just looks too red to me. And I was hoping you would see my smiley face. Let's just make it really obvious for a second. Because what I want to demonstrate is how to remove parts that you painted by mistake. Um, generally, the way I work is, especially like if I'm going in somebody's eye and trying to make it brighter, I usually paint big and erase around it. But again, that's up to you. So if I want to get rid of my smiley face, I hold Option on the keyboard. See how the center is now a minus? So Option to erase. And it looks like my flow is what I was thinking of. I'm gonna pull the flow up to hundred and erase. So now I'm only adjusting where I painted originally. If I don't want it in between the sign, 
I can come in and erase as well. Um, but that's how you clean it up. So we only did it to a tiny part of the image. Um, same idea, I could have, I could click new and I could have just painted all in the foreground and use that to correct my foreground exposure. But you would have to be precise and not end up with spillage. So I don't like to do it that way. Okay, questions about the graduated filter adjustment brush or quick heal? Cool, cool. Um, okay, the last few things we'll do to this image. Um, I'm going to show you color grading, but we're not going to apply anything because we're going to do this more so in Photoshop. But color grading is a way to change the color tone, the kind of general color cast of specific parts of the image. So we have midtones, shadows, and highlights. So if I slide the highlights over to blue, you can see the bright parts of my image turning blue. Um, I can change the intensity, or really the brightness, excuse me. Um, I can change the brightness with the slider. Uh, so, you know, if I wanted to affect my sky that way, it's kind of fun. So shadows would be the foreground. Um, a common thing is to use complementary colors in the shadows and the highlights. We call it split toning um, to give your image this, this kind of finished stylized look. So I could do a little orange and why is this? There we go. A little blue. And then I could adjust the balance and blending. Um, balance will say how much it spills into the other tone. And blending will be how it combines with the details underneath. Um, but now you can also do midtones. So you can, this is how a lot of presets are made to mimic like vintage film, Kodachrome, uh, slide film. Um, we're not gonna play too hard with that today. I think it's something that's really worth exploring. It's gotten far more powerful. If you've done any video work, this is what color grading looks like in most video editing programs. All right, let's close that. So don't lose too much sleep over it. It's on the site if it was a little bit much. Um, you also have a simpler way of affecting colors called HSL, Hue, Saturation, Luminance. Um, I will show you one thing I like is this target mode. If I want to target a specific hue, a specific color, I can click on it and I can say, I want to change the saturation, excuse me. So I'm gonna target a specific hue and change the saturation. So click that little target, go to um, the sky. And if I click and drag down, anything that is that hue will become less saturated. If I click and drag up, anything that is that hue will become more saturated. And if you notice, it's not just the clouds, it's the deer and it's the windows that are reflecting blue sky. So this is a fun way to target specific colors. Um, something I've seen that's really trendy. Oh, by the way, if you don't like an adjustment and you don't wanna undo a bunch of times, you can double click on its name to reset it to zero. Um, some people like to just grab hue and choose a color. And uh, I might end that work. Let's try again. Choose a color and use that to shift the actual color. So that's what hue do. Hue do. That's what hue does. It changes your color. Saturation changes the strength of your color. And luminance changes the brightness. The luminance is how we measure lights, right? OK. Um, hue saturation is a very visual adjustment, so you can see what happens. I mean, they all are. All right, and what do we got? I think the last thing I want to show you is sharpening, and then we got to get into Photoshop because we're going to get weird in Photoshop. So under detail, we have the ability to sharpen an image. Um, as you pull sharpening up, it increases the contrast of what it thinks are edges, um, the middle tone. And a little trick is if you hold option, 
while dragging it, or is it control command? Yeah, if you hold option, you'll see it in black and white, which will give you a better idea of whether it's getting sharper or not. You should definitely be zoomed in to a part of the image that you want to be sharp. And you should definitely use sharpness sparingly. Um, and then you can also change things like radius, detail, and masking. Option or alt, excuse me. Thank you. I always forget that it's, um, it's alt on a Windows keyboard. All right, so if I hold option on masking, well, actually, if we pull it up, it's, it's kind of spooky looking, but we'll see these images, parts of the image turn black. And those are the parts that will not receive sharpening. Um, so it's kind of nice. You see how it finds edges and you see something a little disappointing because it's finding the edges of clouds that you probably don't want to apply sharpening to. Um, you can also hold alter option on detail. And this is my preferred one, but uh, this one shows you the actual, the most prominent edges. It's really hard to see. <laughs> yeah, let's, we're not going to Atlanta yet, Brian. Um, and then radius controls the actual size of the sharpening. Um, don't get too hung up on sharpening. The, the message here is don't apply too much. I usually, don't do more than 25 um, because you can't sharpen a, a picture that's out of focus. You can just make a focused picture appear sharper by adding contrast. Okay, this is all we're doing in Lightroom. And the last thing I'll show you in Lightroom is how to save the edits we've done as a preset. So on the presets menu, you hit the plus, and you hit create preset. And it lets you decide my PDX preset. Uh, give it a name, otherwise you'll forget what they do. Um, and you can decide what you want the preset to save in case you did stuff you didn't like, like transformations um, or lens corrections, you could turn those off. But I'm just gonna hit create. And now under user presets, I have a few here. And I, I, I edited a little bit different on this one. Um, I didn't go as warm, but you can see we ended up with a similar exposure. I think I just put a weird warmth on it at the end. All right. Before we switch to Photoshop, are there any questions? I do have one. Let's go for it. Where? Again, did we access the graduated filter adjustment brush, the one you used to touch up the old town? Oh, perfect. Um, so the keyboard shortcut is K, but it's also the little paintbrush in the top right. So the paintbrush is the adjustment brush, the circle is the radial filter, and then the rectangle is the graduated filter. Okay, okay. thank you. Making a virtual copy. Absolutely, and David, I see your question. Um, virtual copy is just a quick one. So right click, create virtual copy. And we will finish in Lightroom too. We're gonna send our Photoshop edit back in and export out. So David, I love your question. Uh, what are some important differences between Lightroom and Photoshop when retouching or editing? Um, all the edits we just did, we can do in Photoshop. Um, Photoshop has a camera raw editor that has every single slider that we played with. Um, it even has, I believe, the selective editing tools. What Photoshop can't do is easily create presets, um, work non-destructively without thinking about it, catalog your images, batch edits, and um, it's basically that, it's the efficiency side of it. So Lightroom really is meant to help you get your images ready for Photoshop or skip it altogether if you don't need it. Um, because let's say this was a shoot I did and I had 50 different images with this exposure. Aside from the selective edits, I could apply this preset to 50 images with one click and I wouldn't have to open each image individually and, and do things to it. And then I could go and choose which ones I want to send to Photoshop. Um, and then what we're gonna do right now is demonstrate the stuff that we can do in Photoshop, which is kind of an endless list that we can't do in Lightroom.
but let's go ahead and excellent thank you let's let's uh send this to photoshop you can press command or control e or you can right click edit in edit in adobe photoshop and what I would invite you to do, we're going to look at this a little quick. I want to, I don't want to run out of time. Um, if you open the final edit file, I did this kind of quick yesterday. Um, this is the finished product I ended up with in Photoshop. And when you have time, you can look through the layers more closely, but you can see I applied a tone curve to give it that kind of trendy faded look. I applied a gra gradient map to give it a more extreme color style. We replaced the sky. We extended the sky and darkened the sky. So I made two different versions. And if you look at my image, I did some actual retouching that I could not have done with the quick heal tool. So if I uncheck the retouch folder, you'll see I closed this window. I removed this sign remove this garbage and these poles. And that's what we're gonna do right now. Okay, let's go back to our other image. And let's go ahead and start easy here. We are going to remove these trees and a couple of keyboard shortcuts that I already used, command minus, command plus to zoom in and spacebar to move my canvas around. You can use the mouse wheel and trackpad for this as well, um, but I just have a habit of using the hand tool. Okay, what we're going to do is ease into content-aware fill here. So we're gonna use our lasso. It's the third tool from the top. You press L on the keyboard. If you see a different tool, click and hold and make sure you just have your lasso. And what we're going to do is make a sloppy selection around our tree, making sure we don't cross any of the tree itself. We want the space around it to help Photoshop understand what is being removed and how it is removing it. Understand is a, is a generous word, but Adobe Sensei is a really amazing artificial intelligence. Um, I'm not sure if it does any understanding, but it, it sure is clever. All right, so again, I used my lasso. I selected around my trees. If you noticed, when I went to do the rest, I just went around the outside and back to the beginning um, because you can't select outside of your canvas anyway. All right, now let's go ahead and go to Edit, Content-Aware Fill. And hopefully yours is set to auto sampling. If you don't see any green on your screen, hit this auto button. And what you'll see on the left side, I'm gonna zoom out with command minus or control. I'm gonna hold space bar and move it over. The left side is your process. We're seeing what we're removing with the lasso. And you can go and clean it up here if you want. Your lasso lets you add things to remove. If you hold option, it lets you change your mind if I really liked this tree up here. The paintbrush is our sampling tool. And all of this clever stuff Photoshop does depends on sampling. Um, you know, like in, in music, when you sample the drum beat from another song and build a new song on top of it, um, we're sampling, we're taking pixels from one part of the image and using them to replace a different part. Um, so that's why it's aware of your content. I don't want it to use this deer sign as, as sampling. So I can click minus mode and just paint out of that so that it's only sampling sky. And then the right hand side, you can see the finished product. It did a way better job than Lightroom did. We didn't get those blurry edges. And it was honestly, if you ask me, less work than the Quick Heal tool. Um, Quick Heal is for quick little things. If you start making big paintings with it, it really slows your computer down because it's, it's not an efficient tool for large retouching. 
All right, so let's click OK. And I'll show you something else I love about Content-Aware Fill, other than it works great. It works non-destructively too. So you can see it added a layer above my background. And if I hide it by clicking the eye, my tree is still there. I'm just, I just put something on top of it, which is what's really awesome about Photoshop and its layers. Lightroom has kind of simplified layers um, with our selective tools, but here we have the full-fledged, full-featured layers. Um, and we're going to get rid of our selection by pressing Command D for deselect. And what we're going to do is name this part we just did, because if you don't start naming now, you're going to just play catch up later. So you double click on the name of the layer. And then you can name it tree fill. And then you hit enter. OK, let's remove a couple more. I'm going to remove these poles. And I'm actually going to do this slightly differently. I'm going to select one. And here I'm going to be careful not to get any of this blurry car, but I'm going to hold shift and I'm going to select the next post here. So shift lets me add selections. If I don't hold shift and I start selecting, it removes my other one. So command or control Z. We're going to remove this, this uh, storm grate. I know it lives there, but I think it's a little bit ugly. And this black dot. Um, and this one we'll remove next. It's a little more work. All right. We ready to remove some more? I think we are. Edit. And actually, there's a small problem. Um, this is one. This is one of the biggest pitfalls of people learning Photoshop. Make sure you are on, are on the layer that has the information you want. So I was still on my tree fill layer. I'm going to click and select my background layer. Whew, that was close. Edit. Content aware fill. Oh, no problem, Doug. Thanks for joining. This will be available online if you want to check out. The Photoshop part. Okay, and it is thinking about it. This will be interesting because it's using the building for some of the sampling. Um, and it looks like it didn't really matter. If you were worried, you could remove this part and it will do it again. Each time you click and change your sample, it generates a new bit of pixels. Um, so it's always different. So if you're not happy with what happened, just paint around and it'll do it again. But honestly, that looks pretty darn good. I feel good. You can see it, it's so clever that it, it even extended this, this black area, I think. Maybe it didn't. Um, but it will figure out patterns and extend them through what you're removing. All right, let's go ahead and click OK. And we're going to deselect Command D. And now I'm going to name this Posts and Drain. <laughs> That's not an and sign. OK. Let's go ahead and do this post as well, this no parking sign. This is the same thing. We're going to select it, but uh, I need to be back on my background layer. So switch back to background. And I probably could have done them all at once, but I like repetition for learning. So um, make sure you remove shadows along with the object you don't want, um, because the shadows can, can throw things off. All right, I'm on the background layer. Edit, Content Aware, Fill. And this one's not going to come out amazing, but this is our starting point. And I probably should have selected over here too. So I'm going to grab my lasso, hold shift, and grab this part. It's a little bit ugly. So let's let's remove some stuff and see what it thinks. Really shouldn't be using any of the building for this. So I just clicked on the brush, switched it to minus mode, and I'm painting out the green. 
because I don't want it to use any of the building to replace it. Um, I would keep trying if I was making a, a finished product that I, that I love. Um, and in fact, I am going to add a little bit of the brick building because I do want that for the part above it. So we're going to get it to where it's okay enough um, for the sake of time. We're going to call that okay enough. The window got a little weird, but let's just say okay. And okay. So command D, deselect, double click, rename, parking sign. And we've got two more pieces of retouching to do. I want to give this um, floor some privacy. Oh, my computer's struggling. Uh-oh. Um, so I want to copy a closed window on top of this open window. And my, my bridge is, is coming from the fourth dimension. So I, I want to fix that too. So let's go ahead and do this window first. And guess what? We're still just using our lasso. We are using our lasso to make selections of parts of the image that we want to do something with. Um, so let's do that. I have to be on my background layer again. That's where my window is. And what I'm going to do is select around this window. And I'm grabbing more than what I need because that's going to be the key to blending it in. So something like that. Kind of looks like I made, I tried to draw a blanket or something. And we're going to duplicate the selection into its own layer. The keyboard shortcut is Command or Control J for duplicate um, because Command D deselects, right? You can also right click and make a layer via copy. Don't do via cut, we'll end up with a hole in our background. Actually, it's locked, so it doesn't matter, but. Still don't do via cut, do layer via copy or command or control J. Before I do this, were there any questions about content to where fill? Okay, dreamy. So if I were to hide my bottom layer, awesome. Brian's got the keyboard shortcut for y'all. We'll see I have these floating bits of the retouching that we've done. Pretty cool, and there's my window. So I wanna grab that window. I'm zooming in with Command Plus, holding spacebar to move my image around. And I wanna move it over here. So I'm gonna use the Move tool. On the keyboard, the V, the letter key, <laughs> the letter V is our keyboard shortcut um, because M is the marquee. So V for Move, we'll select our first tool, which is this mouse tool. And what that does is it lets you move the specific layer that you have selected if it's not locked. Or if you have a selection made, it moves that selection. Okay, so if I grab my move tool, I can grab this window and just take it anywhere I want on the picture. Of course, I want it on top of this other window. And what we're going to notice is that perspective means that things get smaller as they're further away. So I also need to make it smaller and rotate it a little bit too. And there's one keyboard shortcut or tool that lets us do both those things by going to edit, free transform, or you can see here, command or control T. So I use the move tool, the very first tool on the toolbar to move it over. And then I pressed command or control T to open up free transform. You can still move it around while in free transform, but more importantly, you can shrink it down. You can move outside of the box and get a curved arrow and you can rotate it. And then what else you can do, because it's kind of hard to see underneath, is you can go to the layer and pull the opacity down a little bit so that you can see both your windows. See how we can see the edge here now? And you might pull it down more. If you're like me, I get a little confused if I pull it down too far. And I'd say that that is pretty good. 
So I'm going to pull the opacity back up to 100. And I'm going to click the check mark to save my transformation. OK, um, if somebody wasn't looking closely, they probably wouldn't notice this for a while. But we can see things aren't quite lining up as we would like. But what's nice is we have information underneath that can help our window blend in. Um, it probably could be a little bit smaller. So Command T, maybe line it up more like that. I don't know. That's something that you would kind of take the time. So what I'm going to put on here is something called a layer mask, which we're going to play with more in a little bit. And we're going to move a little bit faster on the last few things. OK. Um, so I'm going to put the mask on. It's this rectangle with a circle. And you'll see now this layer, which we'll rename window, has this white rectangle. If I grab my paintbrush tool and I paint with black on that white rectangle, I can remove parts of that image. I'm basically erasing. But it's not erasing because if I paint with white, I can bring it back. So this is a non-destructive erasure. Um, if you don't have black and white selected, press D on the keyboard to set your colors to the default ones. And you can press X to switch back and forth. OK, so I'm just going to paint with my brush, keyboard shortcuts B. Now I'm hitting you guys with a lot of shortcuts. And I'm just going to paint the edge of this out so that it is blending in with its environment. It's interesting. Oh, I see what I did. OK. I'm going to switch back to white here and come down a little harder. OK. We'll give that a C plus for now. But if we zoom out, nobody's going to think too much about it. OK, this next one I'm going to do kind of quick, but it's the same idea. So I'm going to go back to my background layer. I'm going to select the part of the bridge that I would like to put on top here. So I'm going to grab this part, maybe this much. OK, I duplicate Command or Control J. And I move it with the Move tool, V. And you can see I have a layer problem here. The parking sign layer is above it. So I can move it above it just by clicking and dragging. And that's why you start naming your layers, because I could solve that really quickly. So we'll name this bridge fix. All right. It looks pretty good. And it look, doesn't look good. I'm going to hit Command or Control T, shrink it down, line it up with this one. It was pretty good. It's really not too bad at all. I could rotate it, put it there. And again, because I'm using pixels from the same image and from the same part, I'm not having any issues with matching color, light, contrast. Um, all right, and I'm going to put a mask on it. Grab my brush set to black. And I'm going to remove parts that got a little bit weird. Maybe like that. And again, you would want to work slowly and carefully, but I've got a couple more things I'd like to show you. Um, so the last thing I would do with all of this is plop them in a folder. So let's zoom out. Thank you, Arlene. Pretty good, right? Not bad. Um, so I'm going to click on the first layer, tree fill, hold shift, click on the last layer. And I'm going to hit Command or Control G to group them. They're not smushed together. They're, they are my retouch group. And I can open the folder to see them. OK, that leaves us to our, I think, last few things. Um, we're just going to replace the sky, because I think it's really cool. Um, Adobe has come up with a really great way for selecting skies. Um, you have to be on the right layer, so I'm going to switch back to background. And I'm going to go select. 
sky. So first we'll just select the sky. And you see all those marching ants? It did an okay job, but something weird happened because remember, I didn't actually remove those trees. I put something on top of it. So um, I'm not sure what I would wanna do here. I guess if I'm really happy with my retouching, this is what I would do. I would duplicate my background layer, Command J. If I don't have a selection, it just selects layer on. And then I would also duplicate my retouch folder, Command J. Um, this is getting weird, but I think it's an important topic. So I'm gonna put these two in a folder and just call it original and hide it. And then I'm gonna smush my two layers together. So I'm gonna click on the retouch folder, hold shift and click layer copy. And I'll right click merge layers. Or you could press command E. I just destroyed pixels. I just destroyed layers and I smushed them into one, which is why I made a backup, just in case I made some mistakes. Um, but I am trying to demonstrate stuff, so I'm skipping some steps. Okay, select sky. There we go, pretty good. So what's cool is if you see these adjustments here, um, if you don't see adjustments, you can go to window adjustments. And if I add an adjustment layer, for example, a tone curve, I want you to see what happens to my selection and what is next to my adjustment layer. Do you see the mask there? This is the selection that Photoshop made. Black, it means it did not select it. White means it selected. And gray means it kind of selected it. And it put that on my curves adjustment, which if I click on, is now an adjustment only for the sky. So that's what happens when you take a selection and apply any of these adjustment layers on there, which I encourage you to explore. Um, I don't have time to jump into them yet. Does anybody wanna see that again? Select sky and I applied a curves adjustment and that gave me pretty dreamy sky. It's so crazy. So let's get even weirder. Um, let's replace this guy. Select. Where'd it go? Is it under? I lost it. Sky replacement lives under edit. Okay, all right. So edit, <laughs> I lost it, there we go. Make sure you're on the correct layer, sky replacement. So it's going to make that selection for us. It's gonna select the sky. It's gonna mask the sky out and it's going to put a different sky on there for us. And there is a window where you can choose your skies. Uh, I don't know where it is. Well, here it is, it was hiding behind my chat. So you don't just get a new sky, you can pick different ones. There's all sorts of different skies, uh, just rainbows. <laughs> um, if you click on the sky itself, you can move it around. Um, you can scale it and make it bigger. And it's, it's really on there, right? It, it looks pretty great. It didn't do a good job on the sign, but I'll show you that you can fix it later too. Um, yeah, so lots of skies. You can add your own skies to your uh, bucket of skies as well. Let's click OK. So you see here I have a folder called Sky Replacement Group. The sky can be turned off and on. It also has a foreground lighting adjustment, which I actually don't like, so I'll just turn it back off. Um, and if you look at the other one on the Sky Replacement Group, I ended up duplicating the sky and putting it on top of the sign. Um, we can do that during the Q&A because I'm gonna do the last two adjustments right now. All right, 
replacing this guy is pretty fun, right? So the last thing I'll do is this thing called a gradient map. Um, and the reason I like to show the gradient map and why I didn't go too hard on um, color grading is because you can really visualize what is getting which color, which parts are. So right now it mapped a gradient to my image that is black to white. The black parts turned black, the white parts turned white, and the gray in between turned gray. Let's, let's see a weirder version and let's just do our own. These windows. Okay. So if I make the dark parts blue, there we go. Um, let me step back. I clicked on this bar to bring up the editor. So we'll make the dark parts blue. We'll make the bright parts orange, that uh, trendy combo. So this is kind of what color grading does. Um, this is an extreme representation of it, right? It applies a color to a specific value of exposure, if you will. So here, the darkest parts are getting blue, and then it fades to purple. The grays end up, I'm sorry, to orange. And the middle tones end up with a combination of the two, which is this, this purple. Um, probably don't want a finished image like this. So then what we do is we switch. Let's make this outside of the folder, sorry. Doesn't matter, but I, I just like them outside. We switch the blend mode. And you can see what they do. Overlay is kind of the classic one. Um, blend modes give it a set of instructions on how to combine with the pixels underneath it. So I clicked where it says normal. I switched it to overlay. And I took the opacity down now um, quite a bit because I just want this overall tone change. So blend mode to overlay, opacity to 25%. And then I'll put a curves adjustment as a final adjustment on the contrast. Curves works exactly the same in Photoshop as it does in Lightroom if you put the Lightroom one to that regular mode. I know I sped up a little bit on the last two parts, but let's get this image back in Lightroom, export it out, and then let's ask some questions and play more. All right. So this is my favorite thing about using them together. If I go file and save, and I go back into Lightroom, you will watch this Photoshop file magically show up in your catalog. I think <laughs> it usually works. Uh, yeah, it's 99% saved. OK. And then we'll export, and then we'll We'll have some time for questions. Um, you know, we're done at noon, but we're not going anywhere. So, any questions while we wait for this? I do have one. When you did the sky replacement option, did you need to have the sky selected? No. Nope. Or can you do that? Okay. It selects it for you. It's a whole. It's a whole sequence. So you just make sure you're on the correct layer, and you go edit. Sky replacement. It's really, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, looks like it's saved. So if we go on Lightroom, there it is. And here's the edit we did earlier. So um, colors are a little weird for me, but that's okay. So let's go ahead and save both of these. I'm gonna click on the first one, hold Command, and click on the second one. File, export. Because while the Photoshop one does exist on, on the computer, the Lightroom one does not. Um, this should be set to JPEG. And so interesting, this is big. I do export to um, same folder as original personally, and I put them in a subfolder called edits or finished or sweet picks, whatever. Um, the quality setting depends on if you're printing or putting online, same thing for the size. So we're just going to go in the same folder into a folder called edits. We click export and we watch our folder. It made my folder called edits. And inside there, I have two JPEGs, the Photoshop one and the Lightroom one. The Photoshop one needs some work still, especially in the sign. OK, I think, I think that was the full 
the whole party. Um, so thank you so much for joining me in that. That's a, that's a very common workflow for a finished image. If you ever wondered what photographers do sitting at their computers, um, if they're preparing them for um, commercial or fine art, you would not do this to a journalistic image. Um, that is a big ethical violation because we have created something that does not exist. Yes, Cheyenne, it is pretty intense and very interesting. Thank you, Lori. Um, we are here if you have questions. Um, if you don't have questions, I, the video will be up and you can review this and contact us if you have any questions ever.